Hello and welcome back to the Loyal Sun Show. It's at the Loyal Sons on Twitter. Follow us there and follow us here for Pit Sports content you won't want to miss. If you hate everything, this is the place for you. The Loyal Sun Show, Sunshine Pit, Pittsburgh Sports Now, it's October. You guys know the drill. Whatever. I'm here with Dylan and Squid. Don't sound so enthusiastic to be with us. We're living in hell. It's almost basketball season. No, yeah, that's great. (laughs) That's exactly what everyone wants to hear. Hey, we have a top 15 recruiting class right now. John Hughley just got hurt, too. But let's get right to it. Don't beat around the bush. Pitt lost to Georgia Tech, 26-21. Is it the worst loss of the Narduzzi era? Are we willing to go there? I think that's a great place to start, and I think unequivocally it is. That's a reaction. I said yes. But a lot of people were saying, no, 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 it's Western Michigan. We were, I think we were only 13-ish point favorites against Western Michigan. We were 21 point favorites uh, on Saturday, maybe 22 or 23, whatever it ended at. If you say Georgia Tech, you're not wrong. Yeah, I don't know how people can say that Western Michigan is worse. Um, We are ranked this year. Uh, This goes against our conference record. Georgia Tech this year would get the shit kicked out of them by Western Michigan last year. I mean, we're talking about arguably the worst football team in the Power Five. They came in to Akershur Stadium and dominated the Pitt Panthers. Dog walked them. They fired their head coach and AD less than a week before the game. And it wasn't even like they came out fired up. No. No, they came out and they looked terrible. The first pass they threw went straight off of Eric Hallett's hands, one of three. Could have been a walk-in touchdown. They came out flat. We just came out flatter. You look at the keys, the recipes to losing to a team that you're clearly better than, penalties, turnovers, and not capitalizing on the other team's mistakes, and Pitt checked all those boxes all night long. 11 penalties, like you said, multiple dropped interceptions, three turnovers. <laughs> they couldn't have played much worse. Yeah. So, so outside of that, I mean, what do we, let's dive into it a little deeper. What went wrong? And what, what would you do if you were the head coach? If you were Frank Signetti, if you were Pat Narduzzi, what would you do to fix it moving forward? I don't think... The offense did anything good at all in the first three quarters, aside from the last two drives that were garbage. First four drives were three and outs, and the fifth drive was a turnover on downs. Squid, can we get a read off of the results of the first half possessions? Because I know first few were three and outs. I'll give you the whole game, Dylan. Let's go. Just run through. Sure. Yeah. Start the game. Twist the knife. First drive, three plays, zero yards. Next drive, three plays, five yards. Next drive, three plays, negative five yards. Sounds like a Mitch Mitch Trubisky-led Steelers offense. We got a first down the next drive, but we punted. Turned it over on downs. Then we scored a touchdown. Pitt was up seven to six, and we were like, all right, extra slow start, but we got in the bag. We'll win. It'll be ugly, but we'll win. Uh, We followed that touchdown up with a fumble, a punt, an interception, a fumble, another punt, and then we had the two touchdown drives to end it. But like I said, garbage time, too little, too late. I don't know what the game plan was going into it. We were all saying it's going to be rainy. They're going to pound Izzy the whole game. They came out of the first drive with three passes, went absolutely nowhere. Slovis was off. The play calling didn't do him any favors. They sucked. It felt like they probably thought, Izzy was just going to bail them out. They would just be able to run Izzy 20, 25 times, and that would be enough to score more points than a Georgia Tech team who probably wouldn't score much. But the offense looked lost, and it was just uncharacteristic. I mean, Jared Wayne dropped the first down. Uh, Jared Wayne never drops passes. Jared Wayne dropped a big first down in the first half. Couldn't get anything going. And 
can't even blame it on the elements. It rained for maybe 10 minutes during the game. Georgia Tech played in the same on the same field. The offensive line got pushed around by a team that gave up nearly 600 rushing yards in the last two weeks. There was nowhere to go, and that is a bad defense. Our offensive line, also bad. But I, I don't think they should uh, wear all of the blame. It, it all of a sudden became perfectly transparent watching that game last week that, oh, Keaton Slovis cannot process progressions with any level of urgency. I don't know how we saw what we saw in the first half of the Tennessee game. I After seeing what <laughs> happened on Saturday, that looks like two completely different teams. I really felt like after the Tennessee game, after the injury, these last couple of weeks, it just felt like that's probably what our offense is supposed to look like this year. And it's going to take some time to get Keaton back in the groove of things. But that, looking at it now, that might just be the, uh, so we're, the I'm ceiling. Like, yeah, that not even the ceiling. That might just be an outlier of what this offense, we might not see that offense again this year. That's how I feel right now is maybe he, they were on that day. They were getting some things and, Teams have watched film since then and just shut everything up. But there were multiple times. Finally, pulled myself to rewatch the game before this, and several times where he's just so hesitant, looks pulling back a pass, not even a pump fake, but just pulling it back at the end, not confident in his reads, and it was ugly. We've said it all before. We've said the O line hasn't been great, haven't kept Slovis clean. He's been slow on some of the reads. He's missed a few guys, but also the receivers have been off. But I think he's just a, he's just a little slow going through his progressions. Even when he does make plays, he's getting hit. It's taking too long. I don't know if it's the play calling. Nobody's doing anybody any favors in that offense. No, not. On paper, each unit should be pretty good. But together, they just are not put it together. And it kind of gets into an important fundamental question. Is this who we think this pit team is now, or is, is this just the result of being woefully underprepared for a team for for a game? Because I'm, I mean, if you're looking at it as optimistically as possible, the only way you can explain a team that has performed even okay in the first four games of the season coming out and giving the performance that they did against Georgia Tech is there was just something in the water at the Southside facility this week. They just completely flat-footed, unprepared, no pop, just sleepwalked through the game. Let me ask you this. Will either of you be betting Pitt minus 14 against Virginia Tech? No, I can't do it. Absolutely not. That is crazy to think that that's still what Vegas thinks of this team. Virginia Tech also really bad, but... I can see why the line is there. I know how bad Pitt looked this weekend, uh, and we can talk more about the line when we do our preview for the sports book. But there is a part of me that still feels like that's an outlier, and Pitt sleepwalked into this game. It kind of felt like it was a hangover from the Western Michigan and Rhode Island games, where it was just it just kind of felt like they felt as if they would go against Georgia Tech, they'd be able to just pound the rock, just kind of skim through the game and get the next week against Virginia Tech, get to that bye week, whatever it may be. And it feels like it's a team that hasn't been playing with that much urgency. It's just like, let's grind it out and get to the next week, week by week. And eventually you have to open it up and win, try to win games, try to score points. It, it just feels so much like they've been trying to get to the bye week with a five and one record and as few guys injured as possible. But everybody on the offense was back. Yeah, can't even blame injuries. I mean, Carter Izzy Warren didn't out. play right. Carter Carter got banged up. Izzy ended up going out. Ten carries for thirty-one yards in the first half. Well, there's no excuses for that. You should be fine. The defense was healthy. Yeah. This is our team. Yeah, you can't blame injuries on this one. You can't blame this one on injury losses. I'm, so maybe I'm, if we I'm not hand- blaming injury losses. I'm blaming it on Narduzzi getting really comfortable running a three, four yards in a cloud of dust offense playing ball control and just sitting on the clock, essentially, because that's all all he has all he wants to do. Deep down in his soul, all Pat Narduzzi wants to do is keep his defense off the field and win games by three points. Nothing else matters. It did feel like 
maybe we could have opened things up a little more against Rhode Island, get get them some reps, get Keaton throwing the ball down the field. It's what we said after the game. Felt like, you know, let's just get him to the next week, working on those little screen passes, the quick get it out. I know Keaton said in the post game after the Rhode Island game, they were taking away the deep ball. I have I've trouble believing that an FCS team was able to just completely take away any deep ball options you had. That's That's just an excuse for we didn't really want to show anything this week, and we're just going to keep doing this until we get deeper into ACC play. But I think Pitt was trying to play the long game, and it turns out they're just not that team. They're not good enough to just play the long game. They have to show up every week if they're going to beat Power 5 opponents. Yeah. I mean, they they really aren't who we thought they were to, to... – Put it bluntly, Unlike the they bears. are. The Bears are who we thought they Not were. Not letting them off the hook either. Yeah. No. I, yeah, I, I would agree with that. The team we thought this was in the preseason, it clearly isn't that team. And it's not the team that I thought this was even after Tennessee. And that it would take a lot at this point to change my mind. If you look that. at it last year, Pitt lost to Western Michigan. But people still said, well, all the games are still in front of us. We still have Kenny Pickett. We still score all these points. We can still make it to Charlotte. Uh, nobody's looking at Charlotte right now. We are worried about Virginia Tech and afraid of going 0-2 in ACC play. It is so different. I will say there were people sounding the alarms that after the Western Michigan game, like we might not even get bull eligible. There were those people, but I also felt like a lot of people deep in their hearts were thinking, if we have Kenny Pickett, we have a chance in any game moving forward. We don't have that guy. We don't have a Jordan Addison who can go single-handedly win us a game against UVA like he did last year. We don't have those playmakers to step up. I would uh, like to say that Izzy and Hammond might be those guys, but we don't have either of them right uh, now. I can see Gavin Bartholomew being that guy if we target him more than three, four times a game. Bart's a beast. and 17 yards per catch on the season. It's also near impossible to run a successful offense exclusively through a tight end. Yeah, exactly. So I, I agree with that. We do need to get him the ball more, but yeah, we, we don't have those guys. They're not that guy, pal. When's the last time you watched Pitt this season and thought, wow, that was a really creative play call, or that was like a great... And and that sucks, because I feel like we've defended Signetti pretty hard on this show, despite... I mean, he, let's be honest. He was never given a chance by Panther fans from the beginning. And he showed, I think, enough in the back half of that West Virginia game, in the front half of that Tennessee game. But holy shit, man. That guy couldn't scheme Calvin Johnson open. And how many times did we run a dive on third and long? I mean, the third and five fumble that Georgia Tech took back into damn near the red zone was a third and five run to Vincent Davis. I and know that was one of to, several yeah. that he schemed up. They were trying to get closer to field goal range, two down, go for it, whatever. I don't care. That's not what you should be calling a third and five. We were not running the ball that well. We were bamboozled, hoodwinked, run amok, led astray and flat out deceived about how good these receivers were, how good this offense looked, how Every, good this Everybody who watched was. a practice said that Mumfield was the next Addison. Like... Peek said it, Hammett said it. There were there were ACC analysts and ESPN guys who went to pit practices and said this line is for real, and this young crop of receivers is really talented. We were lied to. Either that or something changed between now and camp. Maybe those bright lights guys couldn't get it done. Maybe. Maybe there's something else that we're missing. We can't see with the naked eye, but it sure feels like this team, this was a team who was breaking down on Natty, on national championship and training camp, one, two, three national championship or playoff or whatever it was. And now they're three and two with a loss to Georgia Tech. So I don't know. Maybe this team just thought they were better than they were. Or maybe we thought they were better than they are. Or maybe this is the wake up call. This is the Western Michigan game that they needed to kick him in the butt and this is the turnaround that's that's the glass half full part of this is maybe Pitt needed a game like this but I really really didn't want the game you know Pitt is going to drop a game that they shouldn't every year it, there's we've been Pitt fans for too long to think that that's not it never happens happen. how you think it will last year we thought right? 
this will be the record going into the Clemson game. We'll have a loss. Clemson will be, nothing goes as planned. We said we'll probably lose to Tennessee and Miami. We all knew there would be another combination of losses, but that just – and we we almost kind it's of college football. Too. We we joke about it as Pitt fans, like you know we we pull up the schedule in the preseason. And we say, all right, what's our what's our certified Pitt loss? Yeah, we're gonna beat Tennessee and then lose to UNC, and they'll end up six and six. Like that's probably what we thought was gonna happen. But deep down, does it dawn on us how deeply pathetic that is? That a program. Even in an eleven win season, can't put it together against every bad opponent that they play. It feels like like I, I hear this joke sometimes about Ohio State because every like four years they'll lose to Iowa or Purdue. But genuinely, every single year, Pat Narduzzi sleepwalks that team into a game against an opponent that we should beat by 40 and lays an egg. What is fundamentally wrong with this program that you can set your watch to that happening every year? I mean, I, I think you can look at it and say they're not a top-tier blue blood program and that every college football team has pretty bad losses. Yeah, I'm not here to defend Pitt, but that's just college football. Unless you're like Georgia almost lost to Missouri. It, it yeah, but this is yeah. this is the team that I care about, so it's exactly. not supposed to happen. Right. Yeah. But then the, I think you can probably chalk that up to pitch just not – we're not Ohio State. We're not Georgia. We don't – you can't just lay eggs and just have your athletes out-athlete everyone because we don't have those athletes. But, yeah, it, it was going to happen at some point this year. It sucks that it was the first game of ACC play, but luckily – the Coastal wasn't disbanded a year early, and the winner of the Coastal will probably still have two losses. So I'm just trying to bring my morale back up because I know I'll be back on the North Shore on Saturday cheering on the Panthers, and I have to start shifting that mindset a little bit. We're about, what, 48 hours removed almost, so I got to start talking myself yeah, off the I just here. I just muster up the courage to watch the final like three and a half minutes of the game because I left the stadium, which I barely ever do. So I got the courage to rewatch that today. Probably by Thursday, I'll be like, okay, we'll get to the lots as soon as they open. Not going to be excited about it, but I'll be back on the horse eventually. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but we we know this. I was I was throwing a tantrum near the end of that. I was ready to start like screaming in this episode, uh, pointing fingers, cussing out both of you guys. Uh, and I'd still like to a little bit, but uh, that's yeah. – I kind of wish that we recorded immediately after games. That would be a much better or reaction. Mid-game. mid-game, yeah. Things got pretty contentious. I probably owe you an apology. I was uh, – you were calling that that game was looking bad pretty early, and I was like, oh, dude, you're being annoying. You're being a, a doomsdayer. I think, I, you, say- I think you threatened to move seats at one point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In our defense – I was like, I can't watch the game with you. In our defense – you do that most games. <laughs> I would I would disagree. I do point out sometimes too much when something wrong happens. Yeah. But like I'm I'm also not gonna sit here and be told I'm overreacting when Pitt has four consecutive three and outs to start the game against Georgia Tech. And I'm saying like, hey, um this doesn't feel like oh, a no, no, slow no, no. start. Not anymore. during the game. Before the game, I almost went up to you and said, Hey, can you not do the thing where you tweet, oh, no, we're going to lose, like, four minutes into the fourth quarter. But I'm glad I didn't bring it up beforehand and, and Dylan took the brunt of that. So, I'm sorry for being right. I'm sorry you were right. I think we all are. Yeah. But to kind of put a closing thought on this game, um, other than the fact that we told all of you what happens when Vinny Davis gets <laughs> – 10 carries in a football game. We tried to warn you. Um, the closing thought is we we came into this season and there there was a lot of gas on our side. There was also a lot of a lot of people, a lot of, you know, national media figures and a lot of journalists saying no picket, no Whipple, no Addison. This team just doesn't have teeth. They aren't going to be that good, whatever. And and we we felt disrespected and disparaged and we we kept receipts we wrote down names 
and they were right. I commented on a TikTok just ranting about how Joel Klatt said that Kansas should be ranked and Pitt shouldn't go into last week. I was like, this Kansas team hasn't beaten anybody. Pitt's coming off an ACC championship. They lost to Tennessee. It's a top 10 team. It's not a bad loss. And look at me now. I'm just a loser who comments on TikToks. <laughs> That's all you'll ever be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think of how pissed we got every time someone said like, yeah, Narduzzi had the highest scoring offense in Panther history and then said, forget all that. We're going back to running the football. I got so pissed off every time I heard split zone duo, shut down full cast, cover three pod, anyone on ESPN point that out. And they were so spot on because so many of the issues this season can be pointed back to. We had all of the tools for like to continue to have an explosive offense. And our head coach said, no, it's going to be 1964 again in here. But maybe, you know, maybe we didn't even have that. I miss Pickett. I miss Jordan Addison. Don't. Oh. I have to do it. Yeah. We said it after the game. You said it after the game. Yeah, but I didn't say it on air. Addison was right. He went through spring practice, saw them lining up in power eye with one receiver split out, blocking three out of four plays, and said, I'm getting the hell out of here. God, Maybe he damn. called Lincoln Riley. We we got to end this segment on something a little bit more positive than that because that is, I think, the darkest pit related thing I've I know, heard we, anyone say. We started say to be loud. a little optimistic towards the end there. Then we just Probably. took a steep nosedive into the depths of hell. So, yeah, let's. Brought us back to earth a little bit. Well, uh, what's bright side? Um, Bye weeks in two weeks. Yeah, we won't have to watch pit in like two <laughs> weeks. So. opportunity on Sunday for our fortunes and our weekend to be turned around when Kenny Pickett stepped into play for the Pittsburgh Steelers against the New York Jets yesterday. However, even that was met with uh, some gray results. But let's start with the positive, because there was a lot of electricity in this city at halftime when number eight took the helm. Well, whenever... We were recording with Lusaka Polite, which you'll hear, I don't know, before or after this, whatever. Uh, I think after. Whenever we wrap that He's up. He's great, by the way. Yeah, keep listening to that. Uh, whenever we finished that up, David told us Mitch Trubisky threw an interception. I was like, I don't even know to watch the game right now. They're going to lose to the Jets. That's going to suck. But I tur- turned it on, and just about the only thing that could spark this city, this team, us, was Kenny Pickett. We got it. Any spike of serotonin in our brains. Mm. I was kicking myself because my friend was in town and he's a Jets fan and we were discussing maybe going to the game. Didn't really want to sit in the nosebleeds. We weren't going to pay 150 bucks to sit in the lower level to watch the Steelers and the Jets. And plus, it's your biscuit versus Zach Wilson. You want to watch yeah, that? My, my morale was pretty low from the night before, but I was kicking myself when they shot a Kenny out and I wasn't there for his debut. And when he scored. Not one, but two touchdowns. I was, I mean, Dave, I haven't, I haven't seen you jump around. You look like, you look like a child. Like you were, you could not handle yourself. I'd take that as a compliment. Yeah, you were jumping around this living room, pacing around pacing like a around. psychopath. Didn't know what to do with yourself, <laughs> and it kind of felt like that's what you could just hear the whole stadium just completely change. Even when the Steelers were on defense, when Kenny wasn't out there, the whole mood, the whole environment, the whole aura around that game just completely I mean not, not just the fans and not just me losing my mind in our living room but it looked like for the first time the actual the players in Pittsburgh Steeler uniforms <laughs> were putting any amount of effort forward. Well not enough effort. There were a few uh, drop passes. We'll get to that. Oh, okay. okay. The, we'll first, the, that. the first one was cool. Like the first touchdown, the QB sneak was really cool because it was like Kenny just scored his first touchdown as a Steeler. Big spike. Yeah. But the second one was just badass. Just seconds after, he just took a shot from Quinn and Williams, got up, started jawing at him, then 
went down and just threw ran. a laser. Threw a laser to Fryermuth, then got up and just ran through a linebacker. To Vintage get Pickett. Into that. Vintage Pickett. It was like I was watching a game on Saturday again. It was. It had successfully saved my weekend until it didn't. I mean, if we can just stay in, like, the sunlight for a second. Okay, yeah. Um, that throw, when he was just getting his head caved in by Quinta Williams, uh, that was the best throw I've seen from a Pittsburgh Steeler since, like, 2018. Since since uh, Ben Roethlisberger's elbow exploded. Yeah, Pickett saw that guy coming from, like, eight yards away, stood tall, courageous, blazer. Just ate it and got up smiling, talking his stuff. That was, that felt like the moment where it was like, okay, we have our new, it's picket time. We yeah. have our new quarterback. And he looked so ready. He was oh, barking he was orders. The ball. There was a point where I think he was like chirping at uh, Pickens for, I don't know if he ran a route wrong, but he was like, hey, let's go. We're just blah, blah, blah. I kind of took that. I remember that. That was on the play. It was after Pickens had the really nice catch yeah. on the sideline. Then they tried to hurry up so they couldn't review. I actually took it as, it looked like Kenny said something about keep getting effing open or something. Yeah. Like, talking up like, you're the man, they can't guard you. That's kind of how I took it. Yeah. And it's more fire or support or anything that resembles leadership than I've seen from Trubisky this year. Mm-hmm. And it's just, we saw it when he was a freshman taking down the number two team in the country. We saw it last year in the ACC championship run. Pickett's a competitor. He has that it factor. Yes. He He's a guy that people want to rally around, and it's something that the Steelers were missing. A lot of quarterbacks, if they threw an interception on their first ever pass, would probably start playing conservative and be super cautious, get it back down for a second. I also love that they just took a shot on his first pass. We, we haven't watched the Steelers throw downfield barely at all this year. It was yeah. nice to just see them take a shot. It didn't feel like Matt Canada's offense for a little bit. Oh, and what a, what a beautiful respite that was to not have Matt Canada as your offensive coordinator, at least in your head. But he, he is such a gamer, and this city is going to fall in love with him when Steeler fans, uh, once Steeler fans stop just being terrible. I think we underestimated how shitty it was when he got drafted by the Steelers that he then had to play for Steeler fans. You have to remember that a lot of Steeler fans live in, like, the boonies of Pennsylvania, so they're Penn State fans, or literally just West Virginia, so they're West Virginia fans, so they're not as gung-ho about Kenny Pickett like we are. Right, but there were, there were, I saw a few too many people today on Al Gore's internet who had anything to say about his performance other than what a, what a bolt of lightning, you know, to the heart of this team. I was actually surprised whenever you watched like the pregame show for Sunday Night Football and a few other of the NFL talk shows, they barely even mentioned the interceptions. They just talked about that was a guy who belonged and should be the star of the rest of the year. Yeah, I think anyone who actually watched what happened could clearly see that. But I, I'm not going to lie, I was a fan of another team and just watched and saw the bottom of the screen. The box score Pickett, trolls. See, Kenny Pickett, three interceptions. I prob- If it was another rookie quarterback, I'd be like, oh, I'm su- surprised that guy sucks. But if you watch the game very clearly, um, the one bad decision... I would say. The, the Friar Muth play probably... Alright, fine, we can talk about the picks now. Well, let's just talk about it. Alright. The, the Friar Muth play was pretty pivotal. That's a play, that's a, kind of a rookie mistake. Kind of have to just get rid of it. And he Absolutely. Got, got some happy feet, and I think he wa- maybe wanted to get rid of it. Didn't happen, and it was a pivotal play, and he gave the just the ball. That was see. massively a rookie play, but at the same time, it hit him squarely in the hands. Squarely. It hit his hands. He probably, he should have caught it. He, you get paid a lot of money to catch that ball. I don't want to bail out Kenny and be too much of a homer. I do. I I do, but I'm not going to. No play, play, that. play that he should, okay. Maybe play, a play that probably should have been made, but the clay pool play, you throw it up to your 6'4 receiver, supposed to be a playmaker against a 5'9 corner, and somehow just alligator arms it and 
hands it directly to Jordan Whitehead, former Panther. Uh, don't do that. Just catch the ball. Make the play. You get Once again, get paid a lot of money to do this. We've heard it. Claypool, what, a week ago saying, uh, we just got to draw plays to get it to our playmakers. We got a bunch of them. Do you think that play, uh, the pick by Whitehead, even made it to the drafts of the Pitt football Twitter account? Or was that, was that just snuffed out in the cradle? Maybe you do the thing like we did for the Jordan Addison plays in our countdown where you like pull like a big box over Kenny Pickett. So they're like, oh yeah, that was Mitch Trubisky. Yeah, don't worry about how he threw it. Jordan Whitehead with the interception. As much as I love Whitehead, that added very little solace. Um, but oh, good God, if you see the the angle from the opposite end zone, where it's kind of head on with Claypool, you could convince me after a number of beers that Claypool was shaving points. He volleyball spiked it. To what? That ball could have hit any part of his body and not gone. Not not come close to where Whitehead was standing, but he put his two little alligator paws out and batted it 90 degrees sideways. Would expect nothing else from a Notre Dame guy. Scumbag. I, that play, though, represents what I do think the Steelers are missing, and it's a quarterback who's willing to just take shots and let the receivers make yeah. some plays. He did it a couple times with Pickens on the back shoulders. The Steelers have just been too cautious this year. It's Trubisky taking care of the ball, doesn't want to turn it over. We have to throw throw some picks. It's okay. Throw it's a fine. gunslinger. Turn the ball over. So, no, that ended up being a good punt. I mean, I know it was, what, first down, second down when he threw it, but that ended up essentially being a good punt. We need to take some shots like that, and I don't think Kenny's afraid to let his playmakers go make some plays. And in the future... The guys will make those plays. I'm sure there will be other plays where we're cussing out Claypool again for drop, but you have to yes. let your receivers, yeah. your professional National Football League wide receivers, let them go try to make plays. And Steelers have been missing that, but I think I think Kenny's going to change that up a little bit. But he is uh, staring down quite the, the road ahead, quite the gauntlet. There's... A lot of criticism coming Mike Tomlin's way for the timing and what went into this decision and the level of preparation that was offered to Kenny. As much as I love Tomlin, it is all super justified. I'm I'm not I'm gonna try not to think too much about Kenny Pickett cutting his teeth against the Bills and the Buccaneers and whatever Eagles. Whatever yeah, yeah. other veritable all-pro team, he's going to have to learn how to play this professional game against. And I'm just happy we're finally here. Tom mentioned after the game, they asked what went into the decision, and he said, just felt like we needed a spark. And clearly he felt like Kenny could give him that spark, and that's exactly what brought it out. So is it ideal to play against maybe what what the number one ranked defense in the NFL your first start on the road 14 point dogs probably not but no one else I'd rather go into battle with than Kenny Pickett Tomlin knew that I needed a spark so he could pick it in for me that's what I think happened he knew that you needed something in your life yes he knew the city needed a spark so it's here Kenny Pickett era is here and all I'm saying is it would only add to the legend of Kenny Pickett if he marched into Buffalo, 14-point dogs, best defense in the league, and just took command. It reminds me almost of another... First uh, career start, yeah? Precisely. Hmm. Pitt was bigger dogs than 14 points against Miami that year. I'll tell That's you that for damn. Much. Only problem is the Steelers don't have a lot of size to you know, cover Stephon Diggs, but... Yeah, outside of that, I, th I think it's pretty much exactly the same. At least we have something to look forward to now. Not going to win a lot of football games in the city of Pittsburgh going forward, but we have Kenny. Let Kenny sling it. Please welcome onto the show, Whippy Old Legend. Eight-year NFL vet, 
current director of the trust by the NFL Players Association, and most importantly, Panther for Life, Lusaka Polite. Lou, how you doing today? I'm doing well, man. Thank you guys for having me. We appreciate having you on. Uh, so we, we felt that this was the perfect opportunity to get you on. Pitt is staring down the barrel of a home matchup against the Virginia Tech Hokies. And uh, as we were telling you before this, um, you played hero against the number five uh, VT team in 2003, correct? Yes. Um, that was, for the three of us, that was one of our first football watching experiences. Um, and and again, hate to hate to date it, but we were about eight years old when it happened. And uh, it was one of the moments that we really fell in love with pit football. Where does it rank um, amongst your greatest career moments? Because you've had quite the uh, football career. Um, it's, it's right up there, man. It's probably it's probably top two, top two or three, just because, I mean, what it what it meant you know we really got turned the corner got over the hump you know with, with that big win and and what it and, and, and personally um i know we'll get into the game a little bit later but just kind of want to jump into it i had a fumble earlier that game and um i remember like just being super hard on myself and thinking like man if we lose this is all on me like and then i told myself like if i do ever get another chance to touch the ball or make an impact in the game i gotta make it count so uh you know we were going marching into that that uh, I think South end zone or East end zone, um, you know, Coach Harris called my number and I was like, you know, this, I got to get in there. I don't care what happens. I got to make it happen. So it, it definitely ranks up there. And that's even, that's including, you know, I played in the Super Bowl and no, it doesn't even, the Super Bowl, honestly, was nothing compared to that win, that electricity, that environment, you know, my hometown, in front of my family, in front of my, you know, my, my community. So it, it definitely ranks up there probably, probably number one, honestly. Yeah, before we get to that game, uh, you mentioned being a local guy and getting to play in front of your hometown team. Uh, talk about that a little bit. You came from Woodland Hills and uh, made a name for yourself at Pitt. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, shoot, that Woodland Hills, the community, I owe everything to. I mean, I'm, I was originally, I was born in South Carolina, and I moved to Pittsburgh when I was seven years old. And, um, t- you know, my parents felt that it was important for me to start to get involved with stuff in the community, meet some friends, and lo and behold, they let me play football. And... It didn't take long for me to fall in love with it. And, and once I started to recognize um, just the, the culture, you know, all the greats, there were a lot of, a lot of great players in the, in the area, the entire group field, right? And I wanted to be a part of that. I, I'll, you know, even when I was in middle school and in, in high school, just watching Saturday, watching guys all from our community playing big time division one football, I was like, well, when I get my chance. I want to be part of that, part of that group. So um, it was, it was instilled in me early, man. And, and, now looking back, you know, it's funny. Uh, I myself should take more time to take a pause and just recognize, you know, you know, those those special moments, you know what I mean? And I know I'm going super deep early, but I just had to, I just, I think when I think about those moments, I'm like, it really built me, re- built me up, right? Really, it's part of my DNA and, and making me the person I am today. So forever grateful for the Woodland Hills community, you know, all the way from the midget program, all the way up through high school, uh, Coach Novak, you know, we still, we're in contact. That's that's my guy. So super, just super proud to be a, a, a Wolverine. Yeah, we're all uh, we're all North Hills guys. So we have some um, great admiration for the Woodland Hills program, uh, but so also some terrible memories at the Wolverina, which is which is in and of itself such a special place. What was it? What was it like to get to start? You know, the significant chunk of your football career playing at such a historic venue. Like I said, man, I mean, and, and honestly, so we got to play in that uh, in that stadium at, at midget football, too. So but it wasn't the wow. same because it's, it's in the afternoon. Right. So it was like it's while it while it was an honor, you couldn't wait to get to that Friday night atmosphere. You know what I mean? So just knowing that that was that was uh, in the workings and that was coming up next. And, and, and like I said, are we I, as a kid, I watched the games and just looking forward to being, you know, get my num- my name, my number called at some point. So being able to play in that venue. And then I, I think, I think a few years after college, there was a big article that came out with the Wolverine being one of the top, you know, places to play in high school football atmosphere. So that, I think it was like a USA Today article or something like that. But that, that was a proud moment, you know, like I said, being that that's where I come from and, and we're proud people in Pittsburgh. So it was super cool. 
being that hometown guy going through the recruiting process, what did that look like for you? Did you know you wanted to stay close to home and play for the hometown team? Or was it just kind of through the recruiting process you you kind of fell in love with it? It was, it was, I mean, I, I wanted to honestly go through the entire process and just kind of figure out what was best for me. Um, you know, first and foremost, family is always gonna be first. And they've been a part of this ride the entire time. So that was a huge factor in you know, wanting to stay home and being able, they, them being able to drive down the street 20 minutes to, to watch me every home game. And even even just being in that conference, you know, a lot of the uh, away games were short drives, like, you know, going to Temple or, you know, whatever. So I, that was a huge factor. And then also just on my visit, you know, we, um, our class was recruited off of a year, the year prior, they weren't very good. They were two and nine. Um, but we just saw a vision and, and I had a, my particular teammates on my visit, you know, uh, we just, we just had a click, we clicked, man. And we were like, man, we come here. Um, we can play early, you know, we can, we can contribute to something and really build something. And, and then we really believed in it. Like the South side facility that wasn't there. It was a cardboard rendering. It was a picture on our, on your recruit. <laughs> it like, Oh, this is going to be here one day. Cause we, our freshman year, we played at Pitt stadium. So all this stuff, like to see the campus now and to see the city now, it's, it's special to be a part of that process because it, it wasn't glamorous when we did it, um, you know, throughout those years as they were building the facility. I remember us getting dressed on campus and then riding school buses across the Hot Middle Bridge to practice because it wasn't done yet, but the fields were done. So we do we do that. And, you know, we didn't open up the facility until I think my red shirt sophomore year. So like three years, we've been. I was there going three years before I started to, you know, be able to benefit from from this vision that we saw on a recruit visit. So um, that that all of that played into that decision for sure. Just being able to be a part of something, you know, play play early, play, you know, and and really not just be a number, but be a significant piece, you know, in pit history. And I feel like our class was, was that. So you you mentioned that uh, you were in the last class to get to play at Pitt Stadium. Um, what, what was it? Your redshirt sophomore year, you started playing at at Heinz Field. Yep. So we did we did Pitt Stadium my true freshman year, which I redshirted, so I didn't play. Then the next year um, we played at Three River Stadium, and then the next year after that we started Heinz Field. So. So Pitt fans love to complain about not having an on-campus stadium and, you know, students having to take a bus 20 minutes to the North Shore. But at the time, how much of a selling point was it to you guys uh, to have the opportunity to play at this new professional stadium during your time at Pitt? I think it was, I think it was, it wasn't a hard sell. I think, I think the piece that people don't realize is, I know they've made some uh, adjustments to the facility now, but when we first got there we actually shared the cafeteria with the Steelers so I remember eating lunch with Jerome Bettis and Heinz Ward like every day you know what I mean and it was wow. just like it was super like normal and, and it was a it was it was cool to, for them to be able to drop a couple nuggets and you know teach you the game and what to expect and how to conduct yourself like that that was I mean that was that was golden you know what I mean so that that's what I remember like yeah the stadium was cool but to see them every day in the parking lot, I mean, we're the, the kid, the college kids are getting off of, off of a shuttle, and then you see like all these guys pulling up in like Bentleys and you know, Mercedes. <laughs> you like, you know, I'm gonna get that one day. It was an extra motivation. So you know, I think I think that was a super cool selling point for sure. Yeah, and getting to learn from uh, Jerome Bettis as far as big boys toting the rock. That's like getting getting lunch every day with Michael Jordan. Exactly. It doesn't get any better than that, man. So, yeah, suit that was a super great experience. I'm grateful for it. So I'm sure uh, seeing the Steelers, being with the Steelers every day was some extra motivation to the league. At what point did you realize that, that was a realistic possibility for you? Um, Probably my sophomore year, um, just because we, I mean, we had we had a lot of guys, a lot of talent, talented guys still getting opportunities, even though we were still building the program. Um, I remember just being a young guy and watching, you know, Kevin Barlow go through the process and Hank Poteet and these guys, and these were our leaders on the team. And, you know, watching them, you know, once again, with just more motivation to be like, you know what, I, I can I can do this. I feel like if I'm out here blocking for Kevin Barlow, then maybe one day I can do that at the next level. So, I mean, that, that all those opportunities, I mean, even Nick, Nick Goings, I mean, our entire backfield played in the NFL. So, I mean, it was definitely uh, – a goal that I felt was attainable around that time. I started to 
really recognize it. And, and then the confidence came with my coaches, had coaches kind of talking about it, just not um, in media, but just high level, like, hey, what are your goals? What do you like? What do you want to do with this? And, you know, you're in college, you know, you're going to get a degree, but you might have an opportunity, you know, at the next level. And that's when it kind of clicked. I mean, I always had the dream, but like, to your point, when it became like real, real, yeah, I would say like my sophomore year in college. Are you sad when you watch football now? You don't see fullbacks uh, getting any love anymore. Some teams don't even have a fullback. Um, you know, it's funny. It's a great question. I I used to be, but at the end of the day, I know it's going to come back around at some point. You know, if the game of football it evolves and it circles back and it, re it, re it repeats itself. And I I know, you know, I don't know whether the, all these coordinators and all these other folks know, but I know at the end of the day there is a necessity for a, a lead blocker and ask any running back, ask any running back who they would prefer to have somebody to clean up the mess so they can get in space at a second level and do their thing. Like fullbacks are a necessity and in the, for the longest, even when you watch the playoffs, the top teams always have a fullback or somebody in that space, like some, you know what I mean? So maybe they're not a true fullback, but they have a lead blocker of some sort when they're trying to disguise their, their you know, their, their formations and their schemes. So you need a lead blocker period. And your Dolphins seem to agree. You, you spent three years with them and then worked in the uh, the office with the Dolphins, and they just brought in Alec Ingold mm -hmm. um, to lead block for a, a bevy of running backs that they have now. So obviously, you know, you are you rubbed off in that building a little bit. Hey, I, I like to think so, man. That was a great, that was a great time. That, that was, a, I know we're jumping around, but when you brought that up, it just made me think about my time there, which was probably the most significant piece of my career because that's when things really, started to take off. I mean, um, that was my second stint with coach Bill Parcells. So for those who don't wow. know, uh, Bill brought me to Dallas. So he was my coach my first three years in Dallas. Um, but then once he left the Cowboys, um, he, I think he took a couple of years off and then he went to the Dolphins as uh, the player personnel uh, director. And he called me, he, he brought me to Miami. You know, he, 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 he kind of molded me and, and, and shaped me throughout my career as a young guy. And then I think he felt like I was ready and he, and, he, and he knew I could contribute with the Dolphins. And then when he brought me in there, it felt it was a natural fit. That's those are Wildcat days. I'm not sure if you guys remember the Wildcat era. With Ronnie Brown. Ricky Williams and Ronnie Brown. So, I mean, all, that, that was a fun time. And, and, and we went from, um, I actually got a ball. Huh, I got a little uh, show and tell here. I actually have a ball. This is not scripted, by the way, whoever watches this. This ball was from my first year. Uh, in Miami, and as you can see, that's the greatest turnaround in NFL history because they were one in fifteen the year before we got there, and then we won the division the next year. Wow! So, I mean, that's why that's the part of the most pivotal moment uh, in my pro career for sure. But that was a good time with the Dolphins. I was just admiring the display uh, behind you. You have you have the helmet for every team that you played for, from yes. Woodland Hills down to. I finished in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah I okay. in Atlanta in 2012. That's my last team. Yeah, man. So this is the display. I got to always put a little disclaimer in there. So I know we'll get to my current role soon, but this is more of a kind of a credibility piece because when I do a lot of Zooms with a lot of uh, retired players and just people in general, it's a much easier conversation, you know, to talk to somebody when you have the instant credibility of being a former player. So I know we'll dive into that a little bit later, but that's what that's for. It's not like a personal shrine of Lou or nothing like that. <laughs> like if, if I didn't have the role I was in, it, these things would probably be uh, in a garbage bag in the basement or something. But no, nah, this is this is uh, that's what this is for. <laughs> They're artifacts. They make they make conversation easier. I, I'm I'm in sales, which is way less interesting than what you do. And they tell us, you know, if you're if you're in someone's office, start looking around for a diploma, pictures of kids, and you smart put it right in front of everyone and it it you know even just from your your collarbone up we can and this is this is a great plug if our listeners don't watch us on youtube and just listen through spotify that they have to do both but it's a i mean it really tells the story of a of a great football career just behind you appreciate that definitely definitely so before we get into your your current role there is one thing i wanted to uh to ask you about um because mm -hmm. ej brighetti connected us and he told me a story about how uh, you you got called into the Patriots. I think it was halfway through a season, right? Yep. And he and the the story goes that the second you were signed, you got a call from a number you didn't recognize 
and it was Tom Brady asking you to run routes. Is there any any truth to that? Yeah. So I mean, um, so when I got and actually it was it was uh, let me back up. I forget the time I got there, but when I got there, you know, you you instantly walk in that building and you have that that automatic respect because of the organization and what they've done and what they and how they've proven to be that, that model has proven to work. So automatically you're going to find out like I need to figure out what I need to do to fit in because they 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 got it going. You don't want to be the, the weakest link. You don't want to be the kind of the, the chink in the armor. So you you want to figure it out. So at the moment, the moment Tom uh, hit me up and it was it wasn't a phone call. He actually uh just pulled me aside in a practice and was like, hey man, you know, I, I know you just got here, but we want to kind of get you in the rhythm so that you know, if your number is called or we need you, we want, I want you to be comfortable, you know, taking my handoffs, taking my passes. And that meant a lot to me because, you know, he's the GOAT. You know, I mean, he could have easily sent a backup quarterback to, hey, throw loose some routes, you know, go through some stuff with him, you know, get him caught up to speed. No, he he did that. That was him taking um, ownership of, of the team and, and making sure that everybody on the team felt, understood their role, and understood their importance of it. So, I mean, I, I'm forever grateful of that type of leadership. And I, I'll take that with me everywhere I go, for sure. And that's, that's kind of how you become the GOAT, I guess. Yeah, seriously. I mean, no matter what, man, like, he look, look what he's done in his, in his current team, you know, with the Bucks. I mean, he, he, it's that, it's that will, like, he, he, he's a guy that's never taken his foot off the gas, clearly, you know what I mean? You can tell that he doesn't rest on those laurels. He hasn't been content with this winning, you know, the ring, the, the rings he's won. He's, his, the same motivation that got him to the league is the same motivation that 20 years later is making him so successful. Like he doesn't take anything for granted, like anything. And I love that about him. And that's any, any athlete, anybody in life should take a page out of that book. And I don't care what you're trying to achieve, whatever your approach is, like you, you better have that type of chip on your shoulder um, and, and really recognize how things work so that you can work them. It's super important. Could you tell when you stepped in that building? I know you said, you know, the body of work speaks for itself with the Super Bowls and all the success the Patriots had, but just the way they handle their day-to-day -day operations, is it a lot different from other NFL teams? By far. I mean, as, as you guys see, I play for five teams. Um, when, you, when you walk in that building, it's definitely a, a no-nonsense approach. It's business, you know, and they're all, every every organization is, is about their business, but they, the, the Patriots have found a way to, you know, really kind of streamline that and, and really build only with personnel that understands that. And that's why you see so much turnover probably at the organization because, you know, you first get there, it may be working out, but if you don't, aren't able to sustain and really bring what is expected of you, then there's always, you know, they, they move on to the, ne the next situation. And it's, it's, very, it's, it's very cutthroat. That's tough. But at the end, you got to respect it because they're getting the results they get. So, I mean, what can you really say? They have a ton of dag on trophies in their in their foyer, you know, when they walk in a foyer. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you gotta pronounce it correctly. <laughs> I don't think you would have gotten called called for the mispronunciation here. Hey man. Hey. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta stay on point, you know. I'm just trying to stay on point. We we appreciate you you assuming we're more sophisticated than we are. <laughs> But uh, so after your NFL career, um, you you made a couple stops. You, you worked for the Miami Dolphins, um, but now you are the director of the NFL PA's uh, The Trust, which aims to give former players health and professional assistance. Um, what kind of services do you guys offer to retired players? The main three areas. Uh, focus that, that we focus on our um, community and connection, just because we know that, you know, players tend to isolate a lot when they're done, when you're not in that locker room anymore. So we try to present um, opportunities for, for guys to still fellowship. And, and there's nothing better than guys um, hanging with each other because we understand it. We've been through it. You know what I mean? So building that, that platform, having that, that outlet is uh, super important. So we, we focus on community and connection. The second one we focus on is health and wellness. Of course, when you're playing for these, these billion dollar clubs, you got the best doctors on the planet. You have, you know, any checkup, you got a scratchy throat, that you're going to get it covered, right? But when you're done playing, um, it's super important that we follow up and stay as equally invested in our bodies as we did when we were players. So there's a tons of 
uh, health and wellness resources that we help provide. Um, one of them, the big ones I'll, I'll touch on quickly is uh, called a brain and body assessment, uh, where guys get uh, a three-day physical um, and you're getting checked head to toe, blood work, sleep study, um, every scan known to man, so that you have a baseline and really understand what's going on with your body so that you can take that information, that private information, and take it to your PCP. And, and if there's some recommendations or things that you need to get done, um, you know, you, we can we can get ahead of things. And this and that assessment alone has saved a number of uh, our players' lives because they discovered things they didn't know was going on. They were able to wow. attack, attack it early. Um, so that, that's one of the big ones that we really like to uh, harp on. Last pillar, I know I've been going kind of long, but the last pillar um, is our personal business development uh, pillar where we really want to help guys in the career space if they need it. The, the most important thing you want to know is we want to cover guys from a social standpoint, from a health and wellness standpoint, and then from a career uh, space, personal development space. So trying to trying to navigate that is always um, a challenge, but it's a fun challenge. And uh, we do a good job. And I mean, this is probably the busy time of the year. I travel, mm -hmm. we're texting back and forth. I travel a lot, trying to, uh, you know, get to as many, all the cities and, and work with all of our players. We have uh, captains that help me with that. So we have trust captains as well that are part of the staff that that really help their former players and they help kind of, you know, be the boots on the ground to connect with guys. And we have those regionally all over the country. So that was a very long winded answer, but in order to, for you to truly understand what we're doing and what I do for yeah, you, absolutely. Just kind of wanted to give you kind of the, the, the framework of that. And um, yeah, so being been in this role a little over a year now. Um, so uh, being a director of outreach is, is a very special space for me to be in. And I, I feel like I find my calling and I'm just loving it every day. No, I, I think I do. It's it's really interesting. You know, I, I think football or uh, football fans, uh, you know, we have a tendency to only really care about the, the number on a guy's jersey but you know when you when you play football you know let's say in your case from you, you go to woodland hills in like 1999 and then you're playing 20 years I, I think a lot of guys arrive at a point where it's like ah this has been my identity for two decades and now what and you yeah. you you were able to get your your mba and and you know work in some back office roles and now you work for the NFLPA, but I, I don't think it's as easy for a lot of guys. So it's important to build that infrastructure. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and I've been flying through that, but yeah, I definitely did get my MBA and I got it through the trust because we have something called the trust scholarship that helps pay uh, for, for guys that want to get a secondary degree or continuing education piece. Um, and, and, and that that's really, you know, was, was pivotal in, in, in me being in this space today because I knew when I retired, I wanted to be taken seriously. I know I needed to arm myself with some tools to my tool belt and you know what better way than to educate yourself, right? So um, being out of school for so many years and then you know when you retire, it was kind of cool just to be a student. You know, I wasn't a student athlete this time around. I was able to really just lock in on, on the uh, curriculum and, and grow. And I think that was, I mean, my brain was, my brain grew. I, I can't lie to you, man. My brain was <laughs> and I was like, like this is what it was like. I was like, geez, Louise, I've been out of the game a couple of years of, of school, but it was it was it was amazing. It was a great experience. And I recommend anyone, man, like, and it doesn't have to be an MBA, but I I, I strongly uh encourage people to continue to educate yourself because you can feel the difference when your brain is being tested and put to work, you can you can tell the difference. So never stop learning. I'll tell you that. So you've done great work with the trust. I know you also spent some time with the Pitt Life Skills Program. Yes. Um, so I kind of see a bit of a theme there. You want to help give back to these athletes. But you touched a little bit on what, what the Pitt Life Skills Program is, because I've only heard high praise about it. Uh, what is so special about that program? And what's it kind of look like for those those athletes? So, I mean, i tell you what, man, the, 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 the Kathy and John Pelosi Family Life Skills Program is the best life skills program in the country. I'm not just saying that because it's a pit thing, it's a real thing. Um, there, there are universities uh, and, and donors dedicated to the well being of student athletes like, like the Pitt family is. Um, the fact that they have you know, roughly 10 full time staff dedicated to the development of student athletes, it's not like most schools, you may have one or two people that can help. You know, help student athletes with a resume or a reference or something. But no, this is there's a department dedicated to the development 
of student athletes. So what goes into that? You know, there's a big, there's a huge mentorship program um, where former, you know, pay, where forever Panthers, we call them, alumni become mentors for the current student athletes. So that's that's one channel of, of the life skills program. Um, and they base, they, they make those matches based on uh, the student athletes major or the career interest where they're looking to go. And we, and, and because our, our alumni base is so strong and so active, it's pretty easy to find people willing to help and willing to mentor and talk to you know these young folks man so that that alone that alone is one this huge channel of, of the of the program but then there's other pieces that um i gotta give a shout out to penny samaya because uh, he, he's been there since day one um where he's built you know this this program and and had a team along him that helped really figure out what student athletes need so of course the career space the career development things um the, the professional etiquette trainings you know the, the job fairs you name it all those things that revolve around transition and, and, and evolving because one thing i know penny used to always talk about and um I, I've, adopt, I've adopted this this man this mindset is school isn't a backup plan you know it's, it's part of the master plan at some point you're going to use it like even if you do go pro I like you know, that. I like that. You know what I mean, like, and most of the people, you know, most, most, we already know the stats, you know, most uh, student athletes don't turn pro. We've seen the commercials and we know that. So, but even with that, if you do go pro, that's good. We want you to, we want you, we want everybody, if that's your aspirations, go for it. But when it's over, I don't want, I don't want anyone to be sitting here and trying to figure, figure out what's next. I want them to kind of already been building that master plan and kind of already having those uh, network, um, the network, active and, and talking to folks and really figuring out, figuring out what's next because there's nothing worse than being caught off guard or caught you know with not knowing where to turn and, and, and time is against you right so um super important that you develop those skill sets early employers love hiring student athletes because there's there's certain you know intangibles that that we that we've learned you know growing up being disciplined and being on time being a team player you know, working in high stressful you know situations, all these different things that student athletes um, do on a daily basis and actually transfer into you know great career moves, great great situations because they're able to you know take that once they discover the skills they have, they can take that and apply it to whatever career they're looking to get into. So that's that's life skills, man. That's awesome and a, and a huge huge leg up for. Uh for the Pitt Panthers uh, to, to have an opportunity like that for its student athletes. Absolutely. So Lou, do you still get to follow uh, Pitt football pretty closely or do you just kind of get the ESPN updates, uh, notifications? I try, I, try to, I try to catch as many games as possible, man. I, I watched the game last night. Um, mm -hmm. I, came, mm -hmm. I, came back, I came back to West Virginia this year, uh, first game of the year. So um, when my schedule allows me, I'm, I'm in front of the TV for sure. I was going to say, because it'd probably be like a a day ruiner if you were just getting the ESPN updates and you saw like, oh, we just lost to Georgia Tech, the worst team in the Power Five. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, it's like that sometimes, man. But I, I, I know I know we're tough. I know we, uh, we'll, we'll bounce back. Hopefully we don't fall too low and we can we can stay in the kind of in the, in the hunt as far as uh, – conference play, but I know we can't, that definitely was a huge loss losing against, um, you know, a conference opponent, you know what I mean? But they'll bounce back. I believe it. I got, I got faith in my guys. We haven't recorded our, you know, recap of the game yet, but I have to assume what you just said is going to be the most optimistic thing about Pitt that is said <laughs> on this entire show. So thank, thank you for it. the silver lining. Hey man, it's it's because I've been there. I've been there, man. Like I trust me. Like I told you guys, I, I never won the, the uh, conference, so I, I can't really speak on that. But they have, you know. And I know it's a totally different team this year, but you know they're going to work. There's a lot of got plenty of time. They have what it takes. They have what they need to 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 win some 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 games and, and really compete this year. So hopefully they put together. Putting it together is always the hardest part. Right. I mean, we that was part of the, the other part when you were asking me earlier about, you know, walking into the, the, the Patriots facility. I mean, they got it together. You know what I mean? And that was different at the pro level. But man, teams are teams. Good teams. It's the same, the same formula. You know what I mean? It's, it's the buy in. It's the it's the accountability. It's I mean, it's all those things from every single person in the building 
So that goes from, you know, coaches down. So once everyone gets it together, I, I'm totally confident that uh, we'll be out there getting after it. But it doesn't feel good because we're, we have high expectations no. as the city, you know, it's Pittsburgh, you know, we're, we're, we're a sports driven team on uh, city and I, and I get it. So trust me, it doesn't feel good at all, but I'm always been that, the glass half full type of guy. So I'm gonna bring that positive, <laughs> that positive vibes back, man. We needed that. And uh, all it takes is a blow out of Virginia tech this weekend. We'll probably be there back. Of so. there you go. We, we always had their number, man. We, we know how to get after the, uh, those hokies. So hopefully it is no different. Let's, let's, let's go. Yeah, hopefully by by you know, this interview brings all of the all of the good anti hokey vibes into Pittsburgh. <laughs> we're we're gonna be channeling you on uh, next Saturday. Let's go, man! It's a homecoming. You know, this is big time. It's a good opportunity to you know shake that shake this loss off and and, and move forward. Like I said, and there's nothing like getting a big W after after you know you take a loss like that. So getting that taste out your mouth, getting back in your groove. Just getting physical, getting after it. It's home, like I said, it's homecoming, a home crowd. What better way to get back on back on the horse? All right, all right. We we might be back on the bandwagon a little bit, a little Just bit. Just a little bit. We're feeling out the bandwagon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep pushing y'all, man. I'm gonna keep pushing. <laughs> so uh, we we did have one last question for you. A little little bit of a a, a fun exercise for you. Um, okay. You are a legend of the Woodland Hills Wolverines, which has produced a ridiculous amount of talent uh for the nfl and for college football over the last you know however many decades um what is your mount rushmore of woodland hills football players so oh man your your the four in greatest a tough spot yeah the four greatest and you can put yourself on or leave yourself off you know i'm not i'm not even no there's no there's no chance i'm not even top 10 not top 15 and I'm I mean that and that and this includes guys that did not you know go to the NFL because I really feel like they were the greatest players you know that ever come through and were the black and turquoise so there's some guys that did play in the league that that'd be on my Mount Rushmore but there's a couple that you know what I mean that deserve to be on there I don't care what happened after high school so number one uh William Tutu Ferguson I'm not sure if you guys know that name. He played with me at Pitt. He was a cornerback um, with, with the Panthers, but we're the same year. And um, he was, I think, the first four-year starter uh, in Willow Hills history. Guy was, a, guy was amazing. Um, I'd probably have to go with uh, Steve Breston, you know? Oh, yeah. Stevie B, you know what I mean? It, it, I've watched him run 80, 90-yard touchdowns since he was six years old. <laughs> I mean, the guy, the guy <laughs> Guys, he, he's gifted, man. Uh, he was unbelievable. Un- unbelievable, man. I was I was five years old when I was at Heinz Field watching him put away my North Hills Indians uh, in the Whippeal Championship. So so thanks for that, Steve. So you Ruined keep, my day. You keep date you keep dating us, man. Like, <laughs> I'm, just put, I'm just gonna put it out there. Forty, yeah, I'm forty one because uh, these guys keep talking about when they were eight and they see me play at Finn and five and <laughs> seeing Steve. So, well, while we're talking about it, uh, I used to always <laughs> trade for you whenever I'd play Madden back in the day. So, appreciate it, man. <laughs> just, keep just keep pouring it on, man. Um, yeah. Um, so, so I have two. I only have two more names for the front of Mount Rushmore. Woody High. That is tough, man. Um, I'm going to have to go with Enrico Fletcher. It's another another great. He was actually a senior uh, my sophomore year, uh, and and his his leadership that entire senior class. To be honest, man, they they're they're the ones that put Woody High on the map. You know what I mean? They they really you know that was our first time you know winning the Whitfield, uh, first time going to states. And that was that ninety six um, ninety six year. Yes, I said ninety six. You guys were super. I don't know if you guys were born yet, but um, yeah, man, <laughs> I got I got to go with Fletch and. The last spot, geez, you guys making it hard on me, man. The Mount Rushmore. I think Coach Novak is the one making this hard, pushing all that NFL talent out of, uh, you know, the the Braddock Woodland Hills area. Yeah, I mean, geez, I'm, I'm like, you guys might have to edit this because I'm, I'm I'm gonna have to ponder on this one because if I get it wrong, I'm gonna get blown up after this thing airs. So I got to make sure I. I was gonna say you're gonna be getting some texts like, yeah, I got left off. Come on, man. <laughs> 
Well, I don't think anyone's going to argue with, with my with my current list right now. I think I think it's it's debatable, of course, but I don't, I think everyone respects my my current list, man. Um, geez, you guys are making it hard on me, man. I'm surprised okay. we haven't heard Miles Sanders yet. I, I don't know if you well, ever got to watch him play, but he yeah, was ridiculous. Oh, he's ridiculous, and I definitely watch Miles. I definitely watch Booby play, man. And I and I I mean he's. I got to give him uh, honorable mention just because it, it will be a running back that I, that I name. Um, you know, people don't know about this guy, but uh, probably the best running back to ever come through there. His name is, we call him GT, Gerald Thompson. So uh, sorry for those who might've thought it was a different list, but that was my four, like my, by far, man, those guys were amazing, man. Tutu, Stevie B, um, Fletch, you know, GT, man, uh, those are my four if I had to pick. The fact that you all right, everybody. So Sorry, names. y'all. <laughs> the fact that you left off so many names that are quote unquote more well known because they made it to the NFL says a lot about uh, the amount of talent. That's and, my point, man. We look, we know, we know JT, we know Jason was there, we know Gronk. Like I, I, I get it, and I play with both of those guys, and they they might text me, they might not. I don't know, but <laughs> they know everyone. Everyone from the community knows, and then so like I guess I'm I'm comfortable with my my top my top four. I mean, the list can go on and on and on, as you guys know. So um, anybody have any uh, – that want to dispute, you know where to find me. <laughs> Give me a call. I'm ready to receive. I'm ready for the ear beating. Go ahead, bring it on. Yeah, I mean, you left off two Hall of Famers, and Lafayette Pitts and Miles Sanders. I, I, I know. It's not a, not a detriment to your list that just ridiculous Woodland Hills. I'm telling you. I'm you telling know. you. When you say when, when you say once you say Mount Rushmore of Woodland Hills, I I got I gotta go with the guys that put in the work at that time. You know, a lot of us, even myself, I, I was a super late bloomer. I mean, I was a solid player, but I I'm not to that point. I'm not even top from. I don't think I'm in the top twenty of the greatest players of Woodland Hills. I don't because just because of that, there's so many talented guys out there. But when it comes to you know getting to those next levels, it's it's not always just about talent, you know, it's, you know, opportunity, um, you know, some, some luck on your side, you know, being healthy. There's a, there's a lot of factors. So it's, it's hard to like not acknowledge the guys, the, the, the greats that really laid that foundation, you know? So sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I think that's a great list anyway, really going to get um, whippy old, uh, football Twitter buzzing on this one. Hopefully, start some good conversation. But uh, uh, we've we've taken enough of your time. Uh, you have you have some NFL football to watch. I think as of as of uh, right now, Mitch Trubisky just threw a pick in Steelers territory. So Uh-oh. I think we all have to go watch uh, watch that nightmare. But Lou, we'll thank not watch you. it. <laughs> no, no. Let's you gotta watch, watch it, man. You gotta watch it. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we have, we have that nightmare to uh, to attend to. But um, thank you so much for your time. Really fascinating to hear about you know your journey and and what you're doing now. And uh, and hopefully again we can bring you know shades of 2003 back to Heinz Field on uh, on Saturday against the Hokies. Absolutely, man. Appreciate you guys, man. Hail to Pitt. 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 Also, my theory is Slovis is a little slow going through his reads, and I don't know what the play calls are. I'm not, I don't have the headset on in the stands, believe it or not, but there are a lot of times when you rewatch the game where Bart is open and Slovis is looking somewhere else. So I don't know if he's not a priority or what, but look at Bart, throw it to Bart early and often. Yes. Yeah, and that wasn't a slight of Jerry Wayne. I just really do think. Gavin Bartholomew is that good, and he's going to be at an SEC school next year because they will use him and pay him a lot of money. Oh, don't even joke about that. Who are we going to play at the scramble with next year, then? Don't wish away our best friend. You're right. All right. Here's one. I We haven't been too accurate in hitting this one, but first touchdown score for Pitt. David, you kick us off this week. <sighs> How many points, if I correctly bet, us getting shut out? A <laughs> hundred. 
not worth it. <laughs> not worth attaching my name and face to that. Uh Just give me a name. I know you got a couple names going through your head. Bradley. Jaden Bradley? Yeah. Coming off a two touchdown performance. Yeah, and maybe he can uh post this reel to Instagram immediately after a loss too. Squid, who you got? I'm going to take the Panther defense. Wow. Wow. For five points. I didn't say five. What do I get? Four. Fine. I'll still take the Panthers defense. <laughs> Good value there. Good value. I'm just going to ride the wave with Bart. I'm going to go over five catches. I'm going to go first touchdown scores Bart again. Um, and just the hopes that they go to him early and often. That's all I got. So. I have the special teams too. So, yeah, you do. All right. Can I change mine? No, no, nope, you're no locked changing. in. Well, who would you change do I get it to? A, who would I change it to? You can't though. But who would you? Uh, Dan Carter. I don't know. There, there's, there's no one that really excites me right now. I don't. That's know. why I took the defense. <laughs> You have little faith. Just kidding. No one should have much faith right now. Okay. You should all be sad all the time. The spread opened at a pretty high 14 and a half. This feels like a big spread, and it also feels right. I can see where why it's put there. Uh, we're going to give our, our prediction for the spread along with the score prediction. I'll kick us off. I don't think they cover this week. I also said... Virginia Tech will score under 14 and a half points. I said they'd be right around 14. I'm going to go 24 14 Panthers. A 10 point win. Get back on track. Get back in the thick of the ACC race, but I still think it's going to be pretty ugly. I'm going 23 13. That was a jump in my head, and I'm one off on each team from you. So, yeah. No Not a very exciting game. Have we established what happens if one of us gets the score right? We won't. So what, we'll just, what if? Uh, you guys were only like two off each on the Western Michigan score. If you get it right, you get 10 points. Is that good? Yeah. 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 Uh, Thirty-one to seventeen. So no it, cover. No cover. Thirty-one seventeen. I so we all feel like they're gonna win by two scores. Why? Why are we so confident this week? Because I was going to say seventeen uh, fourteen, but then I decided no. That you can't stop. Ha- you can't handle that. Please, please stop being who you are, David. I. I, I need to start convincing myself, as I'm sure that all Pitt fans will over the course of this week, that this is just going to be a repeat of last year where we figure it out after our embarrassing loss. I don't think that that's something that we as a program and a fan base should get accustomed to or expect. But wouldn't it be cool? I don't know. Thirty-one seventeen. I already said it. I can't go back on it. I think just from our conversation here tonight, we all have this feeling that Pitt will get back on track. Or is that what you got from this? Or that they need to get back on track. Um, you said they were going to score 31 points and one by two scores. Yeah, but I was just kind of saying numbers out loud. Okay. We are very pessimistic, but at the same time, maybe this just may deep down feel like they're not going to lay an egg like they just did against Georgia Tech. I think we all know that this is... They are better than that team. We On saw. paper, a very talented team. They are better than that team we saw last week. I don't know if they're as good as I thought they were after the Tennessee game, the team that took the number eight team in the country to overtime. But there's a lot in between those two things. There's a lot, very exactly. There's a lot in between that and Virginia Tech isn't very good. They just lost forty-one to ten to UNC. UNC let. 
Appalachian State scores 60 points. Pitt has a good defense. If they lose this weekend, say goodbye to me, man. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> what are we going to do if they lose? Just don't say Please win. Don't. We're not going to discuss that. Right we already now. said they were going to win, so. And our predictions are always right. Just like last week. Or we could just take the PSN money and run. <laughs> we'll think about it. But any departing thoughts before we plead for victory? Uh, it's hilarious how much my real adult life has been ruined and made worse by the action or inaction of a group of 20-year-old kids. I had somebody at work today come up to me and say, sorry for your loss, as if like a family member died to me today. Yeah, except this is way worse than if that were to happen. Yeah. Got a lot of people feeling sorry for themselves. A lot of a lot of distraught fans. When does the goal lot open on Saturday? 1030. See you there? Yeah. Aim for the bushes? Yeah. All right, I'm back in. Please win. Please. Please. I can't take another loss.